the agenda for tonight. We have, in addition to the agenda tonight, uh, we have Fire Chief Zane Gibson um, here this evening, as he has been on previous meetings. Thank you, Chief, for staying with the task force as long as you have it and with your very busy schedule. Uh, Chief Gibson and I uh, had an opportunity to uh, work with the Pierce County Emergency Services Network uh, and to uh, scale out the uh, various uh, logistics for an upcoming uh, vaccination that will be taking place in our community. Uh, at that event, uh, the chief shared with me that he had uh, uh, a public service announcement that he would like to make to our task force. And uh, he shared with me the, the content of that uh, announcement. And I said, absolutely, that, that would be fine to share. So uh, rather than put the chief at the end of the meeting, I'd like to go ahead and start uh, with uh, Chief Gibson's uh, presentation uh, of approximately five minutes. So Zane, welcome. Thank you for sharing with us. Well, thank you for working with us. I, I think uh, Dr. Apostle and I have talked in the past and even going back to Dr. Shepard, uh, it's a unique uh, fire department school district relationship that we have. and. I'm glad that we continue that on and I hope to work with the new superintendent in the same capacity. Um, most of the organizations I've been involved with didn't have this level of uh, working with the school district and it's been something that I, I have enjoyed throughout my career here in Ording. Uh, one little side note about the drop site, um, we are working on Sparky is getting vaccinated as part of our public service announcement. So uh, that that actually is in process and we'll drop, he's going to get vaccinated before the ordering uh, drop site, but we'll go out as part of a public information of uh, Sparky going through getting his vaccination. So we're kind of looking forward to that and um, we're doing some other things uh, here with the local event that we're going to do. I'll share with you guys, we're working on trying to order some daffodils. <laughs> so uh, we want to hand out daffodils during the, uh, during the event, because we're not having a parade per se, we figured out, we'll hand out daffodils. So we're working on that. So That'd be a nice touch. So I'm going to try to share my screen. We, we tried this earlier, so we will uh, see how it goes here. I'm going to do this. I'm going to share. And then from current slide and display settings. All right, you guys able to see that okay? So, everybody see my slideshow okay? Yes. Okay. So, uh, Dr. Apostle uh, introduced me, but my name is Ian Gibson. I'm your, I'm your fire chief. I've been the fire chief here in Ording for about eight years. Uh, one of the things we have to do um, in at the end of 2021, our maintenance and operations levy expires. Um, and we decided to ask for a fire benefit charge to replace that in 2022. And so we put that on the ballot for April 27th of 2021. The fire benefit charge will replace the m &O levy and it also will replace part of the fire levy. One of the things we've been struggling with, much like I know the school district struggles with, is increasing requests for service. Um, a good example is in 2020, last year, we had 390 primary requests for mutual aid from other agencies. That means we weren't available. So more than once a day, we're asking for help. And that's not something I particularly want to live with because of 15 plus minute response times coming from Graham or Sumner, or our primary spots that come to help us out. And as you can imagine, at four o'clock, that could take a while coming from Sumner. Additionally, uh, we lost 174 mutual aid tra ambulance transports. Now, you as the customer still see a no out of pocket expense. We have agreements with our neighbors, and we do the same for them. But what that equates to under the Affordable Care Act, we are receiving some additional funding and that's about $483,000 lost to the district in potential revenue from what we bill insurance as well as some of the um, federal monies that we're seeing. So Chief, it's definitely- Chief Zane, yeah. Chief Zane, I'm sorry to interrupt. I, we're not, are you on slide one? I'm on slide two. Okay, we're not seeing your presented presentation. We're seeing, I think, the wrong screen. Okay, well, let me fix that. 
Thanks, Carrie. Yep. Do, do, do. How about that? I think maybe change the window that we're viewing. Change okay. the window that you shared. Oops. I got it. Come on. How about that? She's saying, no. I think under view, you might want to select, uh, instead of extend it to a second monitor, maybe duplicate it. That's what I was doing, and it didn't, you guys weren't seeing it. Okay. So let's try this. Can you see that? <laughs> so we or, see the first, the first slide. That looks much better. Okay. Yeah. We'll just go, we'll go this way. How's that? We'll go old school. That works. Okay. So I was talking about call volume. Um, and anyways, that is something we got to front some, you got to spend money to, <laughs> we need to front load some, adding some staff so that we can help capture some of the ambulance revenue that we're seeing. And the biggest thing is, is just the long response times. In 2018, we were, we launched something called the cardiac arrest initiative. The national average for survival for cardiac arrest is 10%. And OVFR has been at 10% since 2012. And there's a number of adopting new procedures for cardiac arrest. Some of it's cutting edge. Some of it's um, just changing how we do things. And I was a paramedic for 30 years, so I kind of understand this. And I decided that we needed to make some changes in how we do things. We invested over $250,000 one-time investment in some equipment, training, just changing how we do things. And in 2019, we had four cardiac arrest survivors, and three of those can be directly attributed to our new procedures. And the other factor in that is response times. And uh, I was driving through town going to see my son in Eatonville, and we had a cardiac arrest, and our crews responded with our battalion chief. And all of a sudden, about 10 minutes later, I watch a Graham medic unit coming down the hill, and I realized, oh, my gosh, this is a long time to wait for a med another medic unit to show up. And kind of started a, another factor of we need another unit in service because we could potentially save more lives with that. So our 2018 M&O levy, um, it maintained the district at current funding levels. Uh, it must be renewed at the end of 2021, and it has to be validated. Uh, and one of the things due to the record voter turnout in 2020, which is what our validation is based on, we realized that it would be difficult, if not near to impossible, to validate a maintenance and operation level levy this year. Additionally, they have to be renewed every four years, and it's based on assessed value. And our M&O levy doesn't bring in additional funding. It just keeps us at status quo. So what is a fire benefit charge? It's a, it's a charge that's based on square footage rather than assessed value. Uh, it's leveled a little higher on commercial rather than residential. As you know, boarding doesn't have a lot of commercial, but it does bring in some additional revenue. It also uh, does, um, it is applied to some nonprofit and other uh, properties that we're not actually collecting from right now. Um, and additionally, the fire benefit charge only needs to be renewed every six years, so it does reduce the number of elections that we have to do. It eliminates our M&O levy and it eliminates part of the fire levy. Well, what will this fund? Uh, we'll be able to go from eight firefighters a day to from the current four. So literally, we'll be able to double our staff over a three to four year period. We'll be able to staff the station up on the hill on OK Highway, adding an additional ambulance for response. And this kind of moving us out for a little bit more response time. And this will help reduce uh, response times, insurance rates, reliance on Graham and East Pierce, and could potentially improve our survivability from a cardiac arrest due to the reduction of um, response times. Folks who live in the city of Ording actually have an insurance rating of a four. The district has a three. Uh, with the additional staffing, uh, folks in the city of Ording should, and they're, they're a private company who does this, but should see a decrease in their fire insurance ratings from a four to a three. We'll be able to keep our no out-of-pocket ambulance expense and really start to do more stuff with our cardiac arrest initiative and be able to handle stuff on our own without reliance on our neighbors as much. Bottom line is, what will the fire benefit charge cost? The goal is to keep it at approximately $11 more a month per household. Um, 
It would replace our maintenance and operation levy and would expire at the end of 2028 and need to be renewed by voters. Our fire benefit charge does require a 60% yes vote. The other advantage, I made a shorter slideshow for you guys tonight. Um, one of the other advantage of a fire benefit charge is because it's not done by assessed value, but square footage. So as your house goes up and down, as far as assessed value, your square footage doesn't change. So it really does help stabilize the fire district's funding. A uh, good example is Graham, Central Pierce, uh, Valley Regional Fire Authority. A lot of departments have changed to a fire benefit charge. I wanted to leave enough time for questions, and I want to thank you all very much for the opportunity to do a quick little presentation. Thank you, Chief Gibson. Um, I'm, I'm really uh, happy that you had the opportunity this evening to present this information, non-promotional information, to this great task force. Um, again, uh, Chief Gibson's uh, willing to take on any questions that you may have. Well, hearing none, Chief, I think we'll go ahead and continue with our meeting. And as always, you guys have my email. If not, um, normally under COVID, I'm happy to have people in my office. But <laughs> please reach out if you have any questions. All right. Thanks again. Well, the, uh, the one thing that I can say to start off this meeting is that we can check the box that we are reopening schools in March in the Ording School District. After many, many months of wrangling, uh, being uh, um, wrangling over different issues, hearing different reports coming from the state and from the CDC, um, responding to uh, rumors and, you know, some real concerns from parents who wanted their kids in school. And uh, over time, I think people understood clearly that the educators and school board members wanted to also have our students return to school as soon as possible. Well, we're right there now with our uh, kindergartner, kindergartners and fifth graders uh, attending school on an A-B schedule. We're going to be moving to next week. Our middle school students will start. And the following week on the 29th, our high school will open up in an A-B schedule as well. So we are doing quite well. In fact, we are uh, ahead of where the governor had asked all the schools in the state of Washington to be. So it's our patience has paid off. And so I want to thank our community, our school board, for being so patient with us and the information that has come to us sporadically and sometimes uh, in conflicting uh, messages. But we can be proud that we can check the box. And we're just going to keep our fingers crossed that we don't have any uh, huge infection breakouts, any spikes. Uh, between now and the middle of June. So uh, we're excited about that. This evening, we have both uh, Christy Ellenwood and Alicia Jensen to uh, give us an update how school has gone, how things have started. And I'm just very proud of the work that they've done. Uh, you should see them uh, at their schools. They're all over the place. They're on roller skates. They are busy. And so uh, this evening, I wanted to have them speak to you directly to give you um, a, a real brief uh, snapshot of, of the uh, activities that are taking place in their schools. So um, Christy, Alicia, either one of you can go first. I'm gonna start for elementary, thank you. Um, we are excited, We're, we have all of our students back. Um, PTR was able to welcome fourth and fifth grade back. So that completes our staggered start for elementary entry and um, that's been a long time Welcomed two grade levels at a time it allowed us to have our procedures and our um, plan in place to get that um, kind of under our um, belt and then to welcome the next group back the younger kids actually were able to model it for the older kids which is often the opposite of what happens our younger kids were our experts we have been really pleased with the fantastic job our elementary students have done wearing masks 
social distancing, following um, just our really gentle reminders of our um, COVID safety procedures. Really pleased that when the um, buses unload and um, car drop off happens at 850, I can walk into a classroom at about 853 and students are engaged in learning. They've entered Put their things away and teachers are not wasting a minute of our time i know we had some families say is the two hours and 25 minutes worth it it is because those smaller groups we can um, condense the learning it takes teachers a lot less time to check in with eight to eleven students than it does with 24. the amount of learning that's happening in our classrooms is fantastic today i watched um our second graders working on addition and subtraction strategies. They're back to um, talking about what the learning targets are, sharing their learning. It feels like a school again. Steve was in our staff meeting today. We taught, we we're planning a fire drill. <laughs> I said, school has returned to normal at elementary. Um, and we're just back to business as usual for the most part. I just have to agree with everything Christy just said. Absolutely, it is so wonderful to have all of our K-5 students back in our schools. Kids are doing a great job. And do you guys have any questions for elementary? Christy, I just want to know the, the numbers that are hanging from the cars because they drive right by my house. What are the numbers for? Pick up numbers. So um, they're connected to a student. And as we look down the line, I can see who number 49 is. And we call that student to the gate, 77, call that student. They line up. We can um, have all of our students out to uh, pick up at about nine minutes. Wow. Wow. Well, I'm glad I asked. Great. You'd be amazed at parent pickup at both schools compared to what it's ever been before. Oh, because it was a mess before. Oh, wow. <laughs> Right. So the distancing, I have to say, I, a plus of all of this has been we have really upped our all things parent pickup. Well, that's, Christy and Alicia, I'm just really proud of the work that you've done. Uh, people don't know the kind of work that you did in preparation. Lots of work during the week, on weekends, evenings, and appreciate what you've done with your team. And uh, it's truly been a real success. We are, again, hoping that we can continue and uh, move forward with our next group that will be uh, joining the uh, AB schedule, and that will be our middle school. And so, David Slagle, could you give uh, the committee an update? Sure. So we had, um, <clears throat> we had a, I would suggest a really successful parent night last night. We're fairly well attended. Um, ended up with ze remarkable zero questions in the um, uh, uh, open document that everybody had, which to my mind means um, I'll walk away. I'll feel good about that. Um, I'm going to share in the chat the video that uh, Kevin and I and uh, some of our kids made um, late last week, uh, most of this as one take. Um, I'm not going to show it here tonight. You can go watch it on your own um, avail. And most of our parents last night had already watched it. And so we didn't show it last night. We had to answer a few questions in the chat. Um, staff were pretty anxious. Uh, I think last the last 10 days, uh, we had our uh, building leadership team uh, coalition meeting this afternoon. And um, there was no new territory to cover. So um, I really want to thank my elementary colleagues um, because I do truly believe that a smooth launch with our K-5 kids has set the tone for uh, the community and that we are um, in the middle. You know, my sixth graders come back in their two cohorts uh, tomorrow and Thursday. Um, and then we go full tilt um, with our six through eight on Monday. Um, but I know 
and I, I truly believe that the success we had with uh, the K-5 uh, return just spills over in, into um, the community's faith um, in our, our work with our kids and our work with our staff. And um, so I'm, I'm really um, pleased to see that happen, honestly. Um, we, we've got some different stuff happening, you know, um, inside that video, you can see what our lunchroom looks like. Um, and I have joked, it looks like um, rec time at the old folks home on a Saturday afternoon because there's chairs and uh, individual TV tables for every single kid so that they can face the same direction so they can have their masks off and eat safely. Um, and the entire floor is gridded. Kids, we're going to know where every kid sits at every lunch. Um, so that um, if we have to contact Trace, we can go back and do that work. Um, our classroom teachers have been, honestly, um, amazing um, and have um, really leveraged the lessons learned from our PSE folks who've been on campus since October uh, with kids and um, our SPED staff who've been on campus since September-ish. Um, with kids, there's a lot of lessons learned and that's helped us design our processes. Um, so, you know, I mean, we've navigated a couple of households with COVID um, in the building and um, not had to send people home and not had to quarantine kids. And it's been really, really positive. So I feel really good um, about our launch and um, we're getting down to the lines of questions or such really small grain sizes, I can handle those. They're on individual bases and they're not um, affecting large groups of kids. So I'm honestly, I'm just, just give me some kids. I'm, I'm in this business for kids, just give me some kids. And I get that tomorrow. Um, so I'm, I'm really excited about that. Yeah, well, David, uh, there's a principal's dream is having a great parent turnout at a, an evening event and no questions. And you walk away, drop the mic, and it's just, you feel good about that. So uh, a job well done, a job well done. Uh, is uh, Cliff with us tonight uh, or Matt? Yes, sir, I'm here. All right, Cliff. Yeah, so at the high school, it's, the middle school and the high school are virtually identical in everything that we're doing. We're trying to plan 612. Our tie to the buses is, is, is the first thing you're going to notice that's going to tie us together. So um, something that's become really tight, normally buses would get dropped off anywhere from 715, 720, all the way until 745. Kids are out and about traveling through, talking to each other. That obviously can't happen now, so we have to have real tight schedules. So starting in the morning, the buses are going to hold kids until 740, 745-ish, and drop them off. So it'll be a real tight drop-off which will result in an even tighter drop off at Orient Middle School directly after. Um, so that that's going to be new for kids and that, that socialization before school and kind of congregating at lockers and, and chatting with each other won't be there. Um, but uh, similar to Dave, we did a lot of schools around us have not done um, lunch because they don't want to approach how do we get kids safely to eat lunch. So there's literally splitting half day because of that reason. Um, so Dave and I decided we could do lunch. So we did do the old folks rec center or whatever you want to call it in the grid. So we have 120 tables and chairs inside the Ording High School um, pack. We have three lunches. Uh, what is unique about Ording High School is our campus. We have 13 portables. So kids are going to walk a schedule of six classes. The smallest class can take 13 kids. The largest class can take 19 kids. So in order to do that, we have over a dozen classes that are at their complete maximum. They can't take a single schedule change or it'll move the entire system. Uh, we have English teachers and math teachers teaching in the gym inside the yoga room. And we have teachers on the stage and we have teachers in the pack and teachers in the gym. And if a single schedule changes, um, that will completely alter the system. So uh, normally, Orient High School and Orient Middle School have been known for trying to work kid by kid and family by family. We're not as able to do that now. So those uh, commitments we ask for families at semester, we're going to have to hold tight to. And um, that's going to be tough. It's going to be hard for a lot of folks. Um, it's going to put a strain, I think, um, on some people to find those uh, adjustments inside their households to make the AB cohort work. Um, but after hours and hours, literally moving furniture in every single room, um, measuring six foot by six foot, 
Um, moving kids' schedules, doing everything we could, we found a way to make it A, B. That was uh, something I heard from both this task force and Superintendent Apostle that A, B, C, D once a week just wasn't enough. So we really needed to work to get twice a week and we got there, um, but it's going to be very tight. So just because you represent the community, that's going to be something that's going to feel tough for people because a normal call to the high schools, hey, could you help me out here? It'd be really nice if you could switch my kid from A to B or B to A, just isn't going to be possible. So um, we'll continue to try to work any magic we can in every corner, but um, pretty tight there at the high school. Kids are really excited. We've got leadership kids that have come back to do recording and um, do a freshman academy next Thursday or next Wednesday and Thursday, 24th and 25th. So I have all freshmen on campus all day for those days. Um, our leadership class made a video and I put that in the chat. It's about seven minutes, so we're not going to watch it here, but you guys can watch it on your own. Um, they did a really good job. Cassidy Collins and leadership kids and Mrs. Allman put that together and so it's pretty cute to watch them work and just have kids on campus was amazing so like dave i'm just jazzed to get kids back on campus i love my teachers but i didn't get in the business to uh, run adults we got in the business to run kids so excited to get them back any questions for cliff or david well well, congratulations on your preliminary work and opening the, up our secondary schools. Uh, you know, I, 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 we are dependent upon having a, a great team of people. So your leadership team is to be commended for working with you and, and doing such a great job. Uh, there's another couple of people that I want to thank that uh, have been instrumental in, in working with the district, and that's our union presidents, uh, Jerry Silvernail and, and Denise Thompson have uh, collaborated with the district and, and uh, their leadership is very much appreciated. And uh, we hope that it continues in the district to have that close relationship so they can always work together to identify areas of concern and uh, develop mutually beneficial uh, solutions. So just really proud of that. Um, our teaching staff, our classified staff uh, have been under tremendous pressure this year. It's been a very, very challenging year, and that the word challenging is an understatement, as you know. Uh, we've received mixed messages from the state, from around the nation, from elected officials at the local level to elected officials at the state level. And we've had um, information come to us in, in a very slow fashion. And what do you know? Eventually now our teachers are going to be vaccinated. Well, we were talking about vaccinating our teachers who are essential to the reopening of schools. We were talking about that two and three months ago, but finally it has arrived and uh, we are going to have a, a session next week where our, teach, our, uh, our uh, employees will be able to optionally uh, have a COVID-19 vaccination. And then there's going to be a community event. I believe it's the 26th. And so Correct. Um, we're hoping that uh, it uh, is well attended and, and uh, that uh, the people who want uh, a vaccination can get it. And we hope that there's uh, uh, just an overwhelming uh, turnout uh, at, at the event that's going to be held. Uh, the community event will be held at the high school parking lot. And uh, the Pierce County Emergency Network will be uh, conducting that. They have taken full control over it and uh, they're using their staff to line people up. Our Ording Police Chief is, has stepped up uh, as well as our Fire Chief and his team. We have a, a great uh, group that's going to uh, secure the infrastructure needed to give people shots in the arms while they stay in their cars. And so it should be an interesting sight to see. We've seen quite a bit of that on television, of course, and news accounts, but uh, we're going to uh, uh, see that right in our own hometown. Chris, I see is, is uh, on the screen. Chris, do you wanna add uh, anything to what I've said? I may have had a, a wrong date for the community no. event. You had, you had it right. And so okay. next, um, just so you know, it, a local family approached me um, last week and um, she works with uh, Lincoln Pharmacy in Fircrest. 
Um, and they uh, mentioned that they wanted to work with the Ording School District because they graduated from Ording. Uh, they have kids in Ording. And so we were able to uh, send out a survey this week. Um, it was this week. Maybe it was last week. Last week. Yeah. Um, and um, 46, 46 staff mentioned that they wanted to participate in the program. Uh, we will have start on March 22nd, next Monday, from 2.30 to 4.30 in the pack. Um, and they will have 55 doses available in case some other folks want to um, receive it. They will be able to register and make an appointment online. And I just a minute ago sent Holly all the information. And so we'll be getting that out to staff next week. Not next week, tomorrow. Tomorrow. And then on the 26th. Um, I worked with Zane and with uh, Ording Police Department as well, um, and we have an event. It's going to be a 600 to 800 dose event in our parking lot, and I just sent out information earlier uh, today um, about making sure that staff park somewhere else. Um, because it'll be occurring within the two parking lots between the West Wing and the high school, as well as for in front of the gym uh, and the walkway, the covered walkway. And so it'll be four lanes, uh, four, six, sorry, six lanes, six lanes of cars from eight in the morning until four in the afternoon. And um, my hope is, is that Zane is able to get the uh, daffodils and that we're able to possibly provide some entertainment for um, folks who are in line with some of our um, high school kids and their band. And so um, we haven't worked out all the logistics on that one yet. So yeah, and so it's been uh, a little bit of risk management work in regards to making sure we have our MRUs in place um, and our facilities use uh, things so that we're all in order. Um, but it's, um, uh, I think I'm excited about it. And honestly, I'm excited for the community, but I'm really excited for our school and to be able to offer an opportunity for our staff to get the vaccines. Very good, Chris. Thank you very much. You know, uh, I think we started our task force meetings in May. And we have been on a continuous basis meeting and our attendance at these task force meetings has been excellent. Earlier tonight, we had 32 people listening in. Right now we have 29. So we have a couple of people dropping off. But, you know, I, I just really want to tell you how much I appreciate the fact that uh, these, these meetings aren't real sexy. I mean, they're not very sensational. They don't really excite people. But, you know, people came to uh, listen and to pay close attention to what's taking place in the school district. And I think that uh, they are everyone's to be commended for having the wherewithal to stick with it and show their interest. And I just uh, am very pleased. And I want to tell you that we, we are right now planning for the opening of schools in September for the 21-22 school year. Some people in this community may think, geez, you know, uh, we're probably going to start hearing about the 21-22 school year in June and July. Well, that's right, because we don't know whether or not we're going to be able to open in person in September. Uh, as you know, we were getting mixed messages. Things were changing. Spikes in the infection took place. And um, now that the vaccine has been distributed and more and more people are being vaccinated, uh, there's even greater hope that we can move into some normalcy and in-person instruction. But at this point in time, nobody has told us that there's been a, a, a reduction in the six foot distancing, that there's been a re uh, elimination of masks. In fact, People are saying, even if you get the vaccination, wear your mask, stay at six feet, wash your hands. So that method or that, those messages have continued to be very, very strong. So at this point in time, our conversation among the leadership team of the district, we're planning on a six foot distance. Um, we're looking for uh, requiring masks and we're going to ask our uh, students and staff to wash their hands thoroughly several times during the day. Until we hear something different, we have to stay with the current plan. We're gonna be quick to accept something different, a reduction in the number of feet and distancing, um, and other 
uh, uh, issues that are related to quelling the uh, COVID-19 infection. But whatever we must do, we will do, and we will be, be thorough. And I want to thank Chris Willis for being our COVID-19 um, leader who has been working tirelessly in making sure that everyone is following the appropriate protocols and there's strict adherence to the guidelines that have been provided us. And we want to follow those guidelines. And it's important that we do because we want to protect the safety of all our children and our staff. Uh, the community expects us to do that. And we are going to fulfill that uh, as our top priority. And so we don't know what comes in the fall. We're preparing for school as usual as we know it today. As more information comes, we will adjust and modify our response accordingly. But we want people to understand that we will um, be waiting to hear uh, official words of direction from the Tacoma Pierce County Health Department and the state of Washington, OSPI, CDC, and other agencies that will be weighing in on an assessment of the threat of COVID-19. Um, but uh, I want to be, want everyone to be sure to know that we're already thinking and planning on how to approach the opening of school in September. I think you would expect us to be doing that at this time, uh, even as we move to reopen our middle school and high school. So we're not done yet, a lot of work ahead, and uh, we will continue to verify and monitor and adjust as we move through this school year, and, and hopefully we'll be able to complete our AB schedule through the end of the school year in June. So uh, I'm very, again, very proud to be a part of this team, and uh, it's, it's uh, uh, taken a lot of hard work from a great number of people to make us successful. And we are just praying and, and keeping our fingers crossed that we're going to be able to uh, not have widespread spikes in the infection among staff and students in this school district. Um, I wanted to thank Tony for bringing up the uh, information about how long we have met with this task force and how many people have part participated. And I want to say as a board member, I really appreciate how quickly you set this up. And it's been a valuable way to connect with the community, to gain information and to give information. And it's been great to see, to see this opportunity for the community, the board, the staff to all be working together on this. This has been a great model to be part of. And I think I certainly hope we continue to use this model as a way to get and give information. It's been a great experience. Thank you, Tony. You bet. Thank you to everyone. You, you, you all made it possible uh, for us to be successful. Now, in, in closing, I, I want to share that um, I don't want to set a, a next meeting. Uh, we will um, use this meeting as our closing meeting for the time being. And if we need to come back together, we'll do so as ne on an as-needed basis. But at this point in time, I just want to thank you uh, from the bottom of my heart uh, for your contributions and your willingness to stay with this important process. And again, uh, but we stand ready to take any of your suggestions and recommendations on how we can improve our communications. Uh, it's, it's important that we do the best job possible to communicate with our community. So uh, I thank you all. Uh, in closing, if anybody has anything you'd like to share, you're welcome to do so as Kathy has. So Tony, this is Jennifer Planellis. My question is, if we go to three foot separation, well, how does that, like how many kids could we get back on campus if we did that? You know, I, I don't have the answer to that, but it, I don't think it really adds a great number of more students because some of our classrooms are on a, on a small size. I don't know, Cliff and David, do you have that information? Yeah, it would allow us a lot more capacity in the room. So give us more flexibility to move kids around and scheduling and, and, and probably keep teachers in their original classroom, but it wouldn't allow us to go all kids in yeah. one day. But so we're, pro we're probably no better off other than the fact that it gives us a little flexibility. 
yeah, yeah teachers so are I, I understand. actually um so it's yes six three is two times or three times two is six it doesn't equal a double capacity so um what it would do is honestly um ease some of the space for um and i put it in the chat like we when we have a kiddo that needs to switch from cohort a to cohort b i'm literally counting chairs in a classroom and tracking it on a spreadsheet and i'm sorry that room your third period class on day two well, only has room for 17 kids and it's already at capacity so i can't move you i can't accommodate that request it would give us that bit of flexibility there. Um, uh, so, um, but um, three times two does not equal six uh, for us right now um, at all. Great, but, uh, Jennifer, that's a great question that people in this community will want explained to them. If that distance is, is uh, modified from six to three. Any other final comments? Tony, I'm just wondering, uh, this is Denise, sorry, OEA president, co-president. Um, I was just wondering if the uh, like change of uh, social distancing goes into effect before the end of the school year, will we, will we be making any significant changes or are we going to try to just keep the status quo through the end of the year? I, you know, Denise, I, that's... Uh, uh, it's tough to answer a speculative question uh, at this time, but I, what I can say is we've worked really hard to set up this schedule uh, under these present circumstances. Um, I don't know the total number of school days after spring break. Uh, I think it's rather limited. I have a sense that we'd probably stay with our plan at this time rather than to institute something very different at this point, but it would need uh, a whole group of people to weigh in on that that topic um, and uh, come up with the best oper operational uh, methods to adjust from that reduction from six to three. Any other questions? Okay, well, at this time, I wanna say thank you to everyone and have a good evening.